The various developments that we're talking about here in, uh, in technology uh, are part and parcel of this, this thing called the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. These sweeping changes that we see uh, in a number of different parts of the world and a number of different categories uh, towards the, the end of the Paleolithic, towards the end of the Pleistocene, um, about uh, 40, 30, 20,000 years ago or so. One of the biggest changes uh, is actually something that was commented in that Meserich video uh, as not being present there. Uh, that's not necessarily true across uh, um, sites like Meserich. Uh, and that is art, uh, portable art. One of the things that we found at the edges of Dolnavestinitsa might be called uh, an oven, uh, a, a place where some domed clay was placed over a fire. And, and one of the things certainly that was, uh, was created there were things like, uh, like this. Uh, we're looking at a, a particular famous uh, figure. It's called the, the Venus of Dolnavestinitsa. We, we could debate and discuss that nickname. What it is, is a clearly anthropomorphic figure, a, a, a figure in the shape of a person, which is made out of fired clay. So uh, this is uh, really some of the earliest examples we have of fired clay in the world, 10 to 15,000 years before uh, we have people actually making pottery. Uh, people knew for a very long time that if you took certain kinds of fine grain soils, which we'd recognize as clays, and, uh, and mixed them up with water, you could mold them into to other shapes, and then if you heated them to a high temperature in a fire, they would be locked like that, they would stay like that. Um, some of these, uh, these, these uh, figurines at Dolna Vestanitsa date to maybe um, uh, 25,000 years ago or so. This has been interpreted for obvious reasons as a, as a fertility symbol. Um, the, the figure is clearly human, the figure is uh, clearly female. Uh, it's a female who has a number of the traits that are associated with, uh, uh, with, with pregnancy or, or childbirth, or some swelled hips and swelled uh, breasts. And um, uh, we're talking about something, I think, here that, that you, know, you and I uh, wouldn't recognize as our culture, but we'd certainly recognize it as, uh, as culture. Another really interesting uh, uh, trait at Dolna Vestnitsa is, is this figure. It's a carved figure uh, instead of a clay figure, and it's a, uh, been interpreted by some as a, a picture of a, a woman, um, a clearly a human face, and that face is, is seen as being somewhat asymmetrical with one side of the face having been uh, sort of lower down or, or slack. Um, in the, the communal fireplace, uh, of the of one of the huts is the place that this this particular find was uh, made and nearby we actually have uh, found a, a later on that was found a, a burial uh, of a, an older woman who had signs on her skeleton that she may have actually been affected by nerve damage and had perhaps a stroke or something that left part of her face uh, paralyzed. Um, she was buried with uh, some mammoth bones, with bones of a, uh, a fox placed nearby, and some of it suggested that we're, we're looking at something that might be uh, the beginnings of hierarchy. Uh, was this a portrait of a particularly important person, a person who uh, was, was uh, recognizable, uh, we, that, uh, a person who was so uh, important to this community that a, a recognizable portrait of her was created and and uh, and curated after her uh, her death. The the burial itself seems to have been treated with a special uh, reverence with offerings. Um, is this a suggestion that she was perhaps the leader of this community or more important, a spiritual leader of some sort? Or is this simply a way of, uh, of commemorating a person who was uh, important uh, as a member of family? Uh, is it both? Um, we're at earliest beginnings of what we might see as some kind of, uh, of separated leadership or hierarchy or individual um, uh, identity being uh, created and re recorded by, uh, by our ancestors here, but it certainly is um, an interesting matter for discussion. But probably the most famous prehistoric finds from this period are the cave paintings. And there are a number of different sites that, uh, that we know about, sites uh, such as uh, Lascaux, uh, which uh, were some of the earlier ones to have been discovered. I want to talk a little bit about a particular cave in southern France called Chauvet. Uh, it is probably the oldest 
securely dated art in the world. And what we mean by art is a, a thing that we're going to have to discuss in, uh, and think about in, in this class. Um, it was discovered in, in 1994. Uh, it had been uh, created in and occupied uh, for uh, about a period of 10,000 years, from, from 34 to 24,000 years ago, but it was sealed up by my natural uh, processes uh, of erosion sort of covering over the entrance end, uh, and it was unoccupied and, and unvisited and undisturbed for uh, 24,000 years or so until it was discovered uh, in 1994. I'm going to show a clip that is actually a preview of a, of a movie. It's a commercial movie called The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, made by uh, the, the filmmaker Werner Herzog. Uh, it's a commercial film, but in creating it, he actually collaborated very closely with uh, some of the very famous archaeologists who are, are experts in this period, uh, people like Jean Claude and uh, Meg Conkey. This cave had been perfectly sealed for tens of thousands of years. It contained by far the oldest paintings ever discovered. It is as if the modern human soul had awakened here. This is one of the rare times anyone is allowed inside the cave. This may be the only and last opportunity to film inside. The first time I entered a cave, it was so powerful. Every night I was dreaming of lions. There are no barriers between the world where we are and the world of the spirits. A wall can talk to us. After five days, I decided not to go back in the cave because it was an emotional shock. These images are memories of long forgotten dreams. Will we ever be able to understand the vision of the artists across such an abyss of time? Silence, please. We're going to listen to the cave, and perhaps we can even hear our own heartbeats. sentimental, but I, I think it's impossible to overstate the power of, of finding these things and of looking at these creations uh, through so many thousands and thousands and thousands of years. As archaeologists, how do we approach these kinds of things? How do we understand them? Um, on one level, if we want to call this art, uh, you know, the creation of art is one of the fundamental parts of, of being human. Uh, making art, making representations, interpreting our world, and maybe trying to, to control it on some level. Uh, on the other hand, 32,000 years is a pretty long time, and although we're, we're clearly here uh, dealing with brains that are, are like ours, we're a long way from um, those two and a half million year old Homo habilis that were, were just figuring out that you can smack two stones together and get a, a sharp edge, we're still separated by such a distance that it is, um, it is hard to, to know exactly how they thought of these things. Were, were they art in the same sense that we would call, you know, the Mona Lisa art or a, a modern sculpture art, something for uh, looking at and enjoying? or they may be art in a sense that they are something that makes you think about your world. Um, modern art sculptures can, can do that without even being representational. Um, or are they something else?
One way to help with this kind of interpretive dilemma that you get as an archaeologist is a technique known as ethnoarchaeology, uh, the, the bottom of the three words you see on the screen here. And I, I want to show these three words just to clarify them because they tend to get uh, confused being awful uh, similar to each other. If you take an Anthro 101 uh, introduction to anthropology, you will surely have encountered at least the first two and hopefully the third word here on the screen, ethnology, ethnography, uh, as well as ethnoarchaeology. Ethnography, the middle word here, is the fundamental building block of cultural anthropology. And ethnography is when a cultural anthropologist goes and spends a significant amount of time, usually a year, often more, living with um, a certain group of people. It could be a group of people very, very different from them, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, uh, or it could be a group of people who are very similar. Uh, in fact, anthropologists now regularly and routinely study their own um, uh, their own culture. There are anthropologists on the staff of, of companies like General Motors and Ford trying to understand the culture of, of the workplace of the different groups of people there. Um, ethnography is the result of all of that work and ethnography is when an anthropologist writes a very very detailed account of day-to-day -day life in a given society with all of the specific um, uh, uh, bits and pieces of how they, they get their food, how they relate to each other, the technology, their ideology, and of course the interconnections between all of these different forces. And ethnology is a, a work that has a, a broader scope and often uh, it combines lots of different ethnographic sources. And ethnology is usually comparative, looking at a certain aspect of society like technology or ideology or uh, even something more specific like seasonal hunting patterns um, across several different groups in, in many different contexts. And ethnology combines multiple different ethnographies or the, the detailed day-to-day -day accounts of life in different cultures in order to make some sort of generalizable statement about what it is to be human. That's an ethnology. Ethnoarchaeology is a pretty different thing. It's a much more specific thing. It is a little bit like ethnography in that if you are going out to create an ethnoarchaeology, you are uh, using detailed ethnographic observation in the present. But the goal as an ethnoarchaeologist, the goal when you're doing an ethnoarchaeology, is not so much to understand the people in the present as to use observations about the present to inform your understanding of the past. So obviously we can't talk to a person who's been dead for 30,000 years um, about their, their religion or any other aspect of their society, but cultural anthropologists can certainly learn a lot of things about religion today. Sometimes you can make an argument that there are commonalities between those present contexts where people are able to talk to living people now and a past context that you're interested in learning about. So um, it, it could be a, a modern hunter-gatherer population like the, the, the people you see on the bottom left-hand corner of the screen uh, and the hunter-gatherer populations of Ice Age Europe which painted the image at, uh, at Chauvet. There's some, there's some danger here. You have to be very careful uh, not to let this kind of comparison and this kind of discussion slip into a kind of an easy racism, which is very much been a part of this kind of discussion, and which we'll talk more about when we, when we get to state-level societies in terms like civilization and progress, which I have, I have some, some issues with. Um, Ethnoarchaeologists are not saying quite specifically not saying that modern hunter-gatherers are just like people 30,000 years ago, or even worse, are 30,000 years behind the rest of us. The people who are hunter-gatherers now have gone through 30,000 years of, of cultural change just like everyone else on the planet. The argument is based on the idea that there are things that we can say that are true of many different hunter-gatherer groups now that may well be related to the fact that they are hunter-gatherers. So there are, are cultures, uh, cultural adaptations, and ideas that work very well for hunter-gatherers in general. And so, if they work, if you find them in hunter-gatherer groups in southern Africa, in Central Asia, in, uh, in the New World, they may be things that you could also have found 30,000 years ago in hunter-gatherer populations in Central Europe. The analysis of modern hunter-gatherer religion, for instance, is something that we can't observe directly 30,000 years ago, but we certainly can talk to people about now, has found that uh, in, in very many modern uh, small-scale 
uh, hunter-gatherer groups today, you have a religious leader, a person called a shaman, a person whose job it is, in addition to being a, a gatherer and a hunter, her or himself, uh, some people are, are um, talented at being in touch with other realms, with an animal realm or with a spirit realm, often an ancestral realm, uh, as well as the day-to-day -day life of the human realm. A person who acts as a medium, a go-between. Because of this, archaeologists have argued that uh, something similar probably existed in the past. And, and if you, you go into some of the details of how shamanistic practice works, the kinds of rituals, the kinds of creations of images that are a part of, of many practices uh, that you can observe in ethnologies, in these broader comparative works in the present, uh, as well as going out and doing your own original ethno-archaeological research with the explicit goal of understanding the past. Um, some archaeologists have argued that the cave paintings that we see at Chauvet and at elsewhere were part not so much of art for art's sake, something that we were, you know, have something on our walls to make them pretty and and um, and nice looking, but actually of magic rituals, a kind of magic which we see in ethnographic contexts and we refer to uh, as sympathetic magic, the idea that manipulating uh, one. Um, one thing might be able to manipulate another. So if I have an image of a, a, a horse uh, or um, a, a, a bison, uh, that I can, can manipulate that image and that that actually will have an effect on a bison or a horse far away from me somewhere else in the world. Um, although it, it tends to get misconstrued and misunderstood, you can think for a really quick example of this as something like a voodoo doll, right? You can create, it, theoretically you're supposed to create an image of a person and, and then if you stick a pin in the knee of that doll, that in that image, the person will feel pain in, in their actual knee. Um, the, the suggestion at Chauvet and at these, came to these other sites is that we're, we're dealing with hunting magic. Um, all of these images of um, of animals that are painted on the walls are animals that are uh, probably the ones being hunted by the people who, who lived there. And that in the act of making this painting might actually draw the spirit, anchor the animal to the painting on the wall of the cave and pull the, the herds of these animals towards where the people at Chauvet were living so that they could, uh, they could hunt them. The cave paintings at Chauvet um, overlap each other, and um, this has a lot of effects, particularly if you look at, at how it, um, uh, if you imagine how it looked like when uh, people were entering these caves with nothing but firelight. Of course, this is deep into the cave. There's no other electronic light. There's no sunlight. Um, you only have this flickering, moving glow, which could, could do multiple things, and it, and it sort of would blur the different images that overlay on top of each other and make them look kind of like the animal is moving. The other thing we can conclude about um, the fact that the images sort of overlay each other, sometimes two, three, five images overlapping each other, is that the creation of the image was sometimes more important than the looking at it. Who cares if you're drawing on top of another image of, a, uh, of an animal? The important element here is the drawing of the animal, which is pulling the spirit of these herds towards you so that your, your group uh, can hunt them and can live off of them.